So we're starting again, and we're going to be in the book of Revelation. Again, we haven't been for a while. So uh, the title here is An Angel uh, from Heaven Speaks in Revelation 10, 1 through uh, 11, uh, 5. Uh, now let's, let's just start by looking back on a quick outline uh, so we will know where we are. Uh, we've been a couple of weeks since we've done this. Uh, chapter 10, uh, and most of chapter 11 is like a parenthesis, a, a, a delay between the sounding of, of, of the sixth and, and, and seventh trumpet. And we know in the seventh trumpet, of course, the sixth of the seals, the seventh trumpet is a sound that means that the coming of Christ is at hand. So we have a delay between those. Keep, in, keep this in mind as, as we go through, and I'm going to give a quick outline just to bring us up since it's been a while. Chapter 1 is the uh, introduction. Uh, John's on the Isle of Patmos when he's put out there by Domitian to die and starve to death. And Christ comes and visits John. John sees him and faints. Christ revives him. He preached, Jesus preaches a sermon to him on a Sunday morning, several hours, not just a 20-minute sermon or even an, an hour sermon. Uh, so he's doing it on a Sunday morning. Chapters 2 and 3 describe the church on the earth, uh, or what we call the church age. Uh, and there's seven of them, and there, it's a representation where we see the churches of all the churches throughout all of history. And then we have chapters 4 and 5, which is to, to describes the church in heaven. The church is raptured out. That we are, If we are believers, we're going to be with there, up there then at this time, not going through the, uh, the tribulation period uh, in heaven. And we'll be in that group. Chapter 6 through 19. Now, 6 is, is a summary, but 6 through 19 describes the, uh, the tribulation period, that seven-year period near the end of time. And it's divided, as we know. In two parts, the first part is the first three and a half, which is considered bad, but not ter really uh, terrible, but not as terrible as it's coming, because the last three and a half years are going to be uh, the worst in history that Jesus describes, that the worst uh, time in history. Uh, that's Satan's last inning, Satan's last uh, quarter, if you want to put that towards the games of football and basketball and baseball. But it's his last inning. He's going to try to do everything he can to stop Christ from coming back. Um, God is going to uh, make sure everybody has a chance to uh, hear the gospel message uh, as Satan tries to stop him. Uh, you're going to have 144,000 that we see in chapter 7. We see we have Moses and Elijah coming along. They're going to preach for three and a half years. Well, a little short of three and a half years. And there's going to be probably a TV ministry. It's set up to be able to do things like that. Um, and just before the end, we have angels that get involved and uh, speak in the gospel. So you are going to hear the gospel by the end of tribulation period. And Christ's second coming will come uh, at the end. His second coming sets up the millennial kingdom, a thousand-year reign, as we call it, um, in Revelation 20. Then at the end, Satan is loose for a short period of time. And he, for another rebellion that comes against Christ, he, uh, he ends that rebellion, puts... Uh, Satan finally in the lake of fire uh, after that uh, Revelation 20, 21, the new heaven and new earth, Christ is going to reign forever ever. we go right into eternity from the millennial period another way maybe to set up that division, that division of the book of Revelation is like uh, look, looking at a movie, and I know we're not used to it, uh, there's some CDs like some of my John Wayne's and I think the Ten Commandments, you have two CDs well, the older movies used to do reels, so We'll do it that way, say it's about three reels or maybe three CDs to help us understand um, how this is broke down. Now, the first one is the seals. The seals in chapter 6, that's a summary of the tribulation period. It tells you what's going to happen. Then you have an intermission, a parenthesis, and we have evangelism with 144,000 in chapter 7. Then the second CD or reel is the trumpets in, in chapters 8 and 9, and, and that's a tribulation from the standpoint of the Gentiles. The second parenthesis and intermission, and that's where we are right now. Uh, this today is chapter 11, chapters 10 through 11, uh, and, and the first part of, uh, of chapter 11. Then we have the third part, which is the vials. That's a tribulation from uh, the standpoint of the Jews in chapters 12 through 19. Now, we're in this parenthesis, or this delay, and now in the first coming of Christ, there was a first, a, a, there, were, there were two heralds. There was a human herald, 
which is John the Baptist, and the second herald was uh, was the angels herald Christ, uh, Christ's birth. Now, in his second coming, you're going to have two human heralds, Moses and Elijah, where you had the first, you had John the Baptist, which is in the spirit of Elijah that came, and then you had the angel Gabriel, so, and I tell Mary that the child was going to be born, showed himself to the angels, uh, tell, them, tell the shepherds in the wilderness. But here you're going to have two heralds, uh, two human heralds, and I believe it's Moses and Elijah, and on an... Uh, and no uh, angel herald. Now, a lot of people want to think that the angel herald uh, is Christ here, but we're going to see what this really, I think, is not Christ. I don't think it is. Um, uh, we'll come across that, but I, I, I believe it's just another angel because of the Greek word where it says there that that's one of the same kind. Uh, Dr. Criswell thinks it may be Christ in, in the book that he wrote, but... Uh, I think it's someone else. But before we can look at this, let's look at, at what the angel tells John. He tells John to take the book and to eat it up. And this has uh, only happened about three times in the Bible that a person's been asked to do that. Now, you can't, uh, you can't eat, eat the book, so, you know, what does it mean? It, it means really just taking in doctrine. And, of course, the first time we see it is in Jeremiah. If we go back to Jeremiah chapter 15... You see, where the first time this has happened, chapter 15, uh, it says, No, Lord, thou hast, thou knowest, remember me, and the visit of me, and, and, and reverence me of my persecutors. Take me not away in the long suffering. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. Thy words I found, I did eat them, and the words that were unto me, joy and rejoicing in my heart, for I am called by the, by the name of by the name, O Lord God of hosts. Um, so we see Jeremiah was, was asked, he ate, he ate the words, and they, they tasted different. Of course, you got that. Um, then you have Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 2, and verses um, 8 through 10. But thou, thou son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house, Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, and behold, a, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of the book was, was therein. And he spread it, it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written therein lamentations and mournings and woe. So we see that. And then, of course, here in chapter 10, we see it again. Well, it just, it just means doctrine. You don't eat the book. It means to take in doctrine. Take in the Word of God. That's what it's doing. And... Uh, and we see that it, that it means uh, that that it that it can be judgment. Uh, there, that's the double side of the coin, and I'll probably mention it again. It's just two sided: the sweetness of salvation, the sourness of judgment, of the persecution. And it talked about the persecution, and uh, so you need to put it in your mind. That's what it's telling them to do. So in Revelation chapter ten, uh, the pause between the sixth and seventh trumpet. That we'll get into later. And it says, and I saw only now it's Alos, A-L-L-O-S in the Greek, which means one of the same kind. That's why I don't believe it's Christ. Some people do, and that, that's okay. Has some of the same characteristics that we're going to see. But what happens is it means one of the same kind. We've just been talking about the angels who were releasing all the judgments. So you may say this is the fifth angel, actually. It's coming in heaven already because of the seals they've already released. Five of them, and so we'd have the sixth and seventh through uh, the between uh, the the sixth and seventh trumpet. So we're waiting for that that to happen, um, and that's why we have this pause in this this angel that comes down from heaven. He's clothed with a cloud, and we get that. We say, okay, he's got a cloud. Jesus went up into the clouds. Jesus is going to come back in the clouds to receive us when he, when it's a rapture. And when he comes back the second time, we're going to be coming with him in the clouds. So it's a whole different scene that you can see here when you keep in the context that that is different than, than what this is. And, it's not true. and a rainbow was around his head and his face was as it was a sun and his feet as a pillar of fire. That's why we get, um, it may be Christ, Ezekiel 128 uh, and, and 115. Also, 
uh, be because of that, um, that it's the same type we're talking about. Uh, he's looking, he's coming from the presence of God. If you remember back in Moses and, and Exodus, when he came from God, he had the shining of the face. The angels come from standing around God, and it's the, the reflection of his glory. That's why he sees that. The rainbow um, is talking about uh, that God's not going to destroy the world, world, world by a flood anymore. It's, it's just uh, so the angel is coming back, and that's why he's wearing that. And many, so that's why they say it's Christ. Uh, is because of those things, the cloud, the rainbow, and the face shining. But it's in Greek, it means the same type of angel, so it wouldn't be uh, be Christ at all. And the angel just comes from standing his feet like a pillar of fire. This is talking about judgment. Remember that the seals are judgments, and these are angels throwing judgment out onto the world. So the context that you see that talking about the other four angels, here we have another angel. But it's the judgment that's coming out on the world. An emphasis between the sixth and seventh angel. Um, comes down from heaven. Um, he's standing um, on the aisle. And John sees him. Now, if this was Christ, John probably would have bowed down and also worshipped him. Remember, John did it before. And the angel says, no, don't do this. Because I'm not Christ. That's another reason why I don't think it's Christ. Because John doesn't recognize it, doesn't call him Lord, doesn't try to worship him at all. And so, verse 2, And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set the right foot on the sea and the left foot on the earth. Um, <coughs> the little book is in perfect tense in the Greek, and it means the book will never be closed again. So what is in this book? The book, um, this book is, is open because of the victory that Christ won on the cross of Calvary. When he went to Calvary and he became a sacrificial lamb, a sacrificial baby lamb for us, and took our sins upon himself and died on the cross of Calvary, he win, won the victory. He rose on the third day and he's in heaven interceding for us. He won the victory. That's what this book is talking about. Um, it takes the book. The book it is finally going to be open. You and I have been waiting for this book. You see, it is the title deed to the universe. Throughout our lifetime, the devil has it from the Garden of Eden until the end of time. Christ takes back the ownership. Remember, the devil uh, is going to be the ruler of this world under the permissive will of God. It says in Corinthians that he is the prince of this world. So he, he has that. But one day, but thank God, one day he's going to come. And he's going to take back that title deed, see. And then the devil is gone. The devil, and, and it takes it from Satan, gives it to Christ because he wants a cross. And the devil's reign is over and he will never have it again. Because he's going to be put into the lake of fire at the very end. With all unbelievers there. Again, the feet on the sea with ground ownership. Um, you could go back to, uh, what is it, Joshua? Um, uh, what is it? Deuteronomy, Joshua. Uh, Joshua chapter 1. It means the ownership he has there in chapter 3. It says, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that I have given unto you, as I said unto Moses. So what it means is ownership. So we see this anger come in, in the sea and the land. God owns it all. It's all his. He owns everything. So we see that that's recognizing uh, the ownership of Christ. So the angel <coughs> gives the book to Christ. He takes it back. He's going to have it all. Even Moses, when he walked, uh, he was told that he was going to have the land that was there. <coughs> in verse 3, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roared and when he had cried seven thunders uttered their voices now um, the uh, the lion lion roared with a loud voice uh, I'm told that the lions we hear roar in captivity don't sound like the, ion, the lions that are not in captivity they say you can tell the difference in the roar of those two different lions. But anyway, there's a line there. Christ has taken back the universe. Satan's rule is over. And everybody's excited. They start saying things in heaven. If you remember back in Matthew uh, chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, 
when he's in the wilderness and Satan offers him the world, he had the right to do that because he had the ownership. Well, he doesn't have it anymore. Uh, Christ has taken it back. He's not going to have the ownership any, anymore. And his reign is over. And he's never going to have it again. And remember back there, Christ says, no, I'm not going to take it from you. I'm going to the cross. See, Satan was trying to keep him from going to the cross. See, so we wouldn't have the salvation. He wouldn't be able to provide it if he did it. Um, so and he says, no, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to take it back from you. See, and all nature is joining in from heaven in the agreement that is taking it back. Romans 8.22, Satan uh, will, will no, no longer um, control nature. He no longer be, will be in charge. John uh, is getting ready. And John is getting ready to write this down. John is getting ready to write this down uh, for what he sees. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Um, that's also in Daniel 8, 26, uh, 12, 4, and also verse 9. It says, close it up. Remember, remember, Paul was in heaven, and God told him, "You cannot write this up. You cannot write this." So, we see it's it, it's it's something to happen. God has something; doesn't want us to do it. You're going to have to wait till you get to heaven to see these things. Daniel was told the same thing: "Don't write it down." Paul said, "Paul, don't write it down." So, there's something that God did not want us to know. I, I don't know what it is. It, it's it's a mystery to to us, but He told him not to write it down. So then we have verses five and six. And the angel which I saw stood upon the sea and upon the earth and lifted up his hand to heaven. It's like a salute. Um, I don't know if it's a lifting up of heaven the people doing church today, but most people say it was like a uh, like a salute to heaven. Um, and why this isn't uh, this is another reason why it isn't Christ. Um, and it says in verse six as we go on. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever. That's another reason why it can't be Christ. Because he was an angel swearing by him who liveth forever and ever. Which is Christ. He wouldn't do that. Who created heaven and the things that therein. And the earth and these things therein. Are in the sea and all things which are therein. That there should be time no more. Now um, I've, I've, I've corrected this. Actually um, in the Greek. It's 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 not saying um, time no no long no longer. It means time means delay no longer. So so what is he talking about? We mean time no longer or delay no longer. Well, what it is is the church age has ended. It's over. And the seven years that God owed Israel from the four hundred ninety years that He was promised, then. The cross interrupted at 483 years. That seven years, that clock was stopped when the church age started. So God owed him seven years. So now, uh, delay no longer. The clock is starting now to tick again for Israel because he owes them those others. In other words, the tribulation is going to begin that last seven years. God's time clock for Israel is going to start ticking again to the end of time. After that seven years, Christ comes back, millennial period, then we have eternity. So that's what's happened. That's why it says delay no longer. Get Israel's clock started now. Delay no longer in starting that seven years. Let's get the tribulation period done. So that's what it's talking about there. Then seven, but in the days of the then the but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. The mystery of God should be finished, and he hath declared to his servants the prophets. The church age is over. The mystery of God is the church age. The Old Testament said nothing about it. It talked about uh, the end times. It talked about the thousand-year reign, but it knew nothing about the church. The coming of the Christ and the cross. So the second coming, but not the church. So this is talking about the church being raptured. It's gone before this time. Verse 8, And the voice which I heard from heaven spoke unto, unto me again and said, Go and take the little book 
which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. This again, this is that title deed of the world, which now belongs to Christ. That's this little book it's talked about there. It says, now take it. And Christ owns it. In verse 9, and I went, this is John, and I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thee thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Now, we talked about that before. Now, um, And I took the little book, book out of the hand of the angel, verse 10, and ate it up, and it was, my, it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, it made my belly bitter. What you're seeing, in, and I didn't, I went into it a little bit in the beginning. This is the two side, two sides of the gospel, okay. Uh, and it's always this way, okay. God's word is sweet under salvation. We all, have, all of us that, that understand salvation, boy, it's sweet. We get, we got the sal salvation. That, that's the first side. That's the sweetness side of it. But the bitter side of it is the failure of people to believe the gospel and the judgment. And the mourning and the pain and the everlasting fire, unquenchable fire, all of this. That, 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 that's what the bad part about it is. That's the judgment part. That's what the bitter part is. We don't want people to go and not be saved. Christ wants everyone to be saved. He says, I, I wish that none would perish, but all come to, come to knowledge of the saving gospel of Christ. You know, we want everybody to be saved. We want all our family members to be saved. We want the, our society to be saved. So it, that's the bitter part. That's uh, that, the side of grace. And there's the other side that, that, that's hell. Uh, the side of sweetness, the side of bitterness, the, the side of salvation, the side of judgment, the side of, of rewards, and the side of punishment. Salvation, the two sides of it. So, and I went and the angel and said, unto him, Give me the book and take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly better, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up and it was in my mouth sweet as honey and as soon as I ate it my belly was bitter it's so hard John would have would have fell down if this was Christ like I said and he said in verse 11 unto me thou must prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings in other words preach it's not talking about prophecy and even though this is revelation of the future but John goes back remember John gets off the island he goes back to Ephesus writes these letters and sends them around to all the church. So John is going to do it. Go tell the people about Christ before it's too late. Tell them what's going to happen in the future. Tell people what's going to happen. We need to share the gospel, all the things that's happening right now in our country and what's going forward. You're just seeing a lot of things come true that would, would line up to the book of Revelation. So chapter 11, uh, the second part of the parenthesis, okay, we have the two witnesses, okay, and there was given unto me a reed like unto a it's, it's a surveyor's instrument, a surveyor's stick. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Ezekiel 40, uh, verse 3, um, we see the temple. Now we're also going to have, we're going to have two human uh, witnesses here. Some say they're Enoch and Elijah, but Enoch was a Gentile. So I don't think so. Um, because of that, and then they both they both didn't suffer death. So Elijah went up in a whirlwind. Enoch was walking with God. Um, I'm not going to argue a whole lot with it. I just don't think so. I believe they are Moses and Elijah. Um, they come down from heaven. Um, this is the end of the Jewish age, and it always has a Jewish herald. And since Enoch was a Gentile, it would couldn't be a Jewish herald. Um, so Jesus revealed who they were in um, in, in Matthew 16, um, 28. No, yeah, 16, 20, uh, 28. And I believe that's the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, Um, Matthew, oh, I'm, I'm in verse 20. I gotta go back to 16. Had a wrong chapter. All right, chapter 16, 14, 15, 16. Okay. Um, yep. 
you have, you have in the uh, what did it say 16 or verse 28 I gotta get I gotta get my head together here but he said unto Peter get thee behind me Satan thou art and, oh oh 28 verily I send you that some stand here shall not taste the taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom and in 17, and after six days, took Peter, James, and John, and bringeth them up, up to the high mountain. And it was transfigured before them, and did they not shine like the sun? And his raiment was like the white. And to them, Moses and Elijah talking to him. Uh, this is another reason why we think so, because he's talking to, uh, all the way through uh, chapter 4, talking to Elijah, and they wanted to make it, Moses and Elijah. And I think that's one reason... Um, that they're going to be there. Another um, instance is in Acts uh, 3. Let's see if I can get this one, this one right. Acts 3 and verse 21. Whom the heavens must receive until the times of restoration of all them which God has spoken of his mouth of all his holy prophets since the word began. So that's the that's that's where the millennial. Um, I don't know where I got that. I must have that passage wrong. I think it's twenty. Okay, for Mo Moses truly said unto the fathers, the prophet shall the Lord your God rise up, and you shall that your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it, and it shall come to pass that every soul which is not will not hear the prophet shall be destroyed from ab among the people. So it has to be one of the prophets. So that's why we see Moses and Elijah. Uh, Matthew, what is it, 17? I should have done that before. 17, 11, and 12. And Jesus said, and said unto him, Then Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah is come already, and that they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they like, listed likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer them. So we, I, that's why I think it's going to be uh, Moses and Elijah, because of those passages there. Now read for the surveyor's instrument. And what temple? Well, remember, Solomon's temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. by Nebuchadnezzor, and then it was rebuilt, Zerubbabel's temple, in 516. And then Herod um, got another and did some things, and so they called it Herod's temple, which he did some renovations to Zerubbabel's temple. And Herod's temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. by the Romans. And now uh, the mosque of, uh, I think it's Omen is there now, but it will come down, and the unbelievers will build a new temple. And some said it doesn't have to come down. I don't know. They said it go just beside it, but whatever. Um, new temple will be built. And that temple, that is going to be measured. Uh, you leave out the outside court uh, in this one, where the statue is, is going to be uh, put up that Satan's going to do. And here now we are three and a half years. When this statue goes up, the uh, desolation. Jesus said it in Matthew 24, 15, Daniel uh, 8, 13, and 9, 27. The abomination of desolation. And if you don't worship uh, this statue and bow down to it and take the mark, you're going to starve to death. You're not going to be able to do anything economically. You're not going to be able to buy, sell, or even have food. This is the temple that is going to be measured with this reed or temple. The temple is built at this time, uh, by unbelievers, most of them are going to be built in this temple. <coughs> in verse 2, But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Three and a half years. This is the end. The, which was sometimes it's called the Great Tribulation. This is the end. The three and a half years that he's talking about, 40 and two months, just another. 
There's another thing we'll read is times, 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 and half a time. Three and a half years, the Great Tribulation. Um, verse, uh, verse 3, And I will give power over my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy or preach a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. Preach two weeks short of three and a half years. Moses and Elijah, if you want to throw Enoch in there, go ahead. But they're going to preach up to two weeks short of three and a half years. Then the angels come. Then Christ is going to come back. There is just a period of time that they won't be preaching, not the full three and a half years. They're going to be there. In Daniel 8 and Daniel 13, 5. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now this is talking about the prophet's message. Uh, this is going to come, they are going to come to earth. Uh, Moses and Elijah, also in, in Ezekiel talks about it, and they're going to be preaching the word of God. These are going to be the two candlesticks. And I know there's something about those candlesticks, too. I just don't have it here uh, talking. But there's something about the candlesticks that they're going to stand in before God. Psalms 58, 2, Jeremiah 11, 16, and Zechariah 4, 3. Now, verse 5 as we end tonight. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man shall hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Uh, Numbers 16, 27 through 35, Jeremiah uh, 110, Ezekiel 43, 3, and Hosea 6, 5. Moses, they're going to be, they're going to preach for three and a half years. And like I say, in Jerusalem, I believe it's going to be a television ministry. The whole world is going to be able to see them and hear them. And millions are going to be saved during this time. Millions of people are going to be saved. And at the end of that time that they will be there, they are going to be killed. God's going to allow them to be killed. Uh, <coughs> those two. And then God will rise them, raise them up. And that's going to cause a real stir as he raises them up out there. Because the Antichrist is uh, uh, going to think he's won. He's killed these men that have pestered them and given the gospel message. Just like today, people think the gospel message is, is irritant. It's a pestilence. And we see our side, society trying to stop church trying to get it out of our society trying to draw god out of here and during this uh, pandemic they're looking like they're going to try to close things down again and keep people from going to church they're trying to stomp out the first amendment folks uh, even even supposedly joe biden even he has mentioned that the church needs to be more liberal in their thinking mm -hmm. And to change things. So it's becoming a dangerous time, and that's what they're trying to do. But these guys are going to be raised up. And of course, they're never going to be killed again, but it's going to shock the world. Um, and, and what's going what going to happen there? Uh, uh, and we'll pick up there the next time we, we come together. And and how about how about you? Um, is God going to ri to raise you up? Is God going to take you to heaven when you pass away? Um, do you know that? Do you know him today? Do you know for a fact that if you were to die today that you would go to heaven? Uh, do you know that? If you don't know that for a fact, you can. And you see, I, I end these, it really, it's just, it's just a simple thing. Uh, everybody calls them the ABCs. And that's to acknowledge that you're an enemy of God. Jesus says when we were enemies, Christ died for us on the cross. That's why he went to come in to show us his love for us. No greater love can a man do but, but to lay down his life for someone. We need to acknowledge that we are, we are sinful. We have broken God's law. That's all it is. You've broken God's law. You're not obeying God's law. You want nothing to do with him. So uh, <coughs> basically, that's what we call a sinner. So we need to, you need to acknowledge that. That's the first thing. Hey, acknowledge that you have sin in your life. And you've broken God's law. And you're not in, in his family. As I've mentioned all through here before, you've got to believe. You've got to believe that, that Jesus came and human took on human form in a hypostatical union. God, man. And he lived for 33 years here on the earth, showing us that we can follow God's law. And of course, he was perfect and, 
and that's why he had to die for us because we can't be perfect not here when we get to heaven we won't take the old sin nature away and get our new glory glorious bodies yes but not here and so that's why he died as the bible says once he died for once and he's not repeatedly died. he died once he became the sacrificial baby sacrificial lamb once for our sins we need to believe that you need to believe that <clears throat> and he rose on the third day and he went to heaven and he's interceding for us now we need to confess that see believe and confess confess with the mouth believe in the heart confess with the mouth and thou shalt be saved jesus says if you will come to him with the right heart and ask for forgiveness he will forgive you of all of your sins past present and future and impute his righteousness to you for eternity and you'll have eternal life and you won't have to go through what we're talking about because then you'll be in god's family and you can know that and you'll know the sweetness of salvation and never know the bitterness of unbelief but you have to do it i can't do that you have to come to him honestly asking for forgiveness of sin you have to come to him that's what you have to do it's all your choice so let me just end in prayer father again we just thank you for this time that you've given us this evening and lord just use the words i said i know there's uh kind of brokenness and, and some of the things that I said it just wasn't real smooth tonight but Father would you just take that and use it and Lord we just pray for our country we pray for our leadership the salvation of them Father we pray for this COVID thing to go, go away so that we can get back to our churches and living our lives like we need to and witnessing to people and Father help us to do that and it's one here to hears this Father uh, we know your word does not come back void Father just take it and use it Father to, to introduce them to yourself and so they, they can come to know you to release the burden, Father, to have, the, to have that heavy load uh, lifted from our shoulders that is called sin and rebellion. Help that person to do that. And, Father, thank you again. Thank you for the salvation that you have provided. Thank you for your word, Lord, that we can study it and try to learn what it says. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for this. And if you hear it later, thank you for listening to it. 